Uh, this film was banned in China, which is interesting because it's on message with the broader Chinese portrayal of the Japanese in China as committing horrible crimes and being the bad guy, right? So you would think the government would accept a film like this. Hey everybody, my name is Nick. I'm a director living in Taiwan. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the film Devils on the Doorstep directed by Jiang Wen. You may know Jiang Wen actually. You've probably seen him in the film Rogue One. And if you watch Asian films, you may have seen Let the Bullets Fly. So he acted in and wrote this black comedy that's set in China during the Japanese occupation. A man called Wu, which means me, leaves a captured Japanese soldier and his Chinese translator, who is an enemy collaborator, with a family in occupied China. They leave it with Ma, who is played by Zhang Wen. Ma is told to hide the enemy and get information from them, and then the enemy will be retrieved. The village doesn't want to be involved in the war, but they're in a sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation where they feel like they need to collaborate, but they also are afraid of the repercussions by uh, Japanese troops if they're caught. So there's risk in doing this, but there's also risk in not doing it because if the Chinese do end up winning the war and it was found out that they didn't help, then they will be called something called Han Jian, which means like, uh, like bad Chinese, basically. People that collaborated with the Japanese during the war were called Han Jian. This film is very farcical and a lot of silly situations arise trying to hide these POWs in this uh, in this small town. So for example, when the Japanese soldiers come and they have to like do a lot of like slapsticky routines to try to, to try to stop them from getting away. There's a lot of funny miscommunication that happens with the Japanese soldier being unable to understand or speak Chinese and the Chinese translator being kind of the go-between who any kind of softens the, the, the rhetoric between the, the Chinese people talking to the to the prisoner and the prisoner like, yelling back at them. So there's a little funny kind of comedic moments that happen. Uh, I would say a lot of this film is slapsticky, farcical. It's very interesting that that they filmed this very serious subject of Japanese atrocities in China as a farce. Uh, I think this approach is one that is risky but also pays off pretty well for Zhang Wen and he's able to pull it off for two reasons. His characterization of Ma, the man tasked with hiding the POWs, is really humanizing. He acts out the fear and the kindness of this character really well and so we connect with him as a character and it allows the movie to have a lot of heart. There's some very sweet moments where he's talking to this woman that he's having an affair with and they're talking about what they're gonna do uh, when the war is over and he talks about you know, wanting to take care of the baby that she's carrying of his. And so because of his characterization, we really connect with him. And so this isn't just a jokey film about war crimes. There, there's, a, there's a root of humanity at the center with the characters that we're following. And the second reason that this film works as a farce is that when the inevitable war crimes do occur, the tone of the film abruptly shifts. So it's as if we're in a Three Stooges movie and then all of a sudden, these horrible consequences start We're very rapidly in a different movie. The tone is not like that anymore. And this allows the film to work. We have this slapsticky like dunk dunk knock in on the head kind of kind of goofy violence, but then we when the violence is real, it's not treated in the same way, which makes the film very affecting because of the contrast. It's all fun and games until the Japanese, you know, murder your family. I think the goofy farcical nature of this film also serves another very important purpose. Uh, this film was banned in China, which is interesting because it's on message with the broader Chinese portrayal of the Japanese in China as committing horrible crimes and being the bad guy, right? So you would think the government would accept a film like this, and yet the government doesn't. The government doesn't like this movie for some reason. At least at the time it was released in the year 2000, it was banned. And it actually received praise and awards in Japan. And it's interesting because the Chinese, I think, don't like this film because 
the Chinese portrayal, the people of China, is that they're not heroes. They're scared. They're a little weak in this film. They're willing to sell out however they can to save themselves. They're not these nationalistic saviors, and they're not martyrs either. They are just people that are trying to get by. And this is very different from the way that most war films want us to see victims. They want us to see them as these noble martyrs that stood up and then were crushed by this evil, horrible enemy force, right? But this film doesn't do that. And so I think for this reason, it's not a government-friendly depiction of the citizens of China. It kind of makes a lot of sense why this film is banned because at its core, it's fiercely anti-nationalistic. I think it's very interesting that the way that he shows the people in this film, they're weak and they're scared and they are ineffectual. They don't know how to kill people. They don't know how to get information. They don't know how to spy and do all this kind of stuff. They are as most of us would be in a war situation. They don't really care that much about the honor of their country either. The people that do care about the honor of the country are portrayed as monsters. And this to me is the important theme of the film. It's that wanting to save yourself and protect yourself and your family and your town is the only noble act of war. And I think that's a really interesting and unique message. Humanity is wanting survival and the survival of the ones we love. All else in war is monstrous. We see this with the main character, Ma, who, who, who is our like scared hero. He's always like, throughout the whole film until the end, he's freaking out, he's worried, he doesn't know what to do, he's trying to do the right thing, but he, he's like afraid. And we can tell from his depiction and his actions that he is not up to the tasks that are put in front of him. And so in that way, he's a mirror to us. He's how we feel, no training, we don't know what to do, and we're thrust into this war situation. He doesn't want to kill. He just wants to protect himself and the woman he's having an affair with. He portrays this wanting to save yourself as something very virtuous. He's a virtuous character in this film. And I think this is a stark, stark contrast to many war films where the trait of wanting to save yourself is seen as detestable. Characters that are primarily concerned with survival sell people out. They're like the bad guys in most war films. They're like the spineless people that betray their company, betray their friends, betray their country. And what this film does is it takes Ma, whose character's motivation is survival, and it has him drive the story. And he is the most virtuous and relatable of all the people in the story until the end when his motivation shifts to revenge and then he becomes monstrous. And maybe this shift is justified, but it's still the shift that takes away his humanity. And it also causes his inevitable death. We see this theme again arise in the Japanese soldier. At the start of the film, he feels like he needs to be honorable and virtuous for his country. And he, and he acts very viciously to the Chinese, the people that are trying to help him and in a way. I mean, they captured him, but they're, you know, they're not treating him badly. They want him to live. They don't want to kill him. Ma especially treats him very well. And the Japanese man is very vitriolic and yelling at him and telling him he wants to kill him and trying to get him killed. And the Japanese man only gains his humanity when he comes close to execution and he realizes that he wants to save himself, he wants to live. And this desire to save himself causes him to act more humanely to the people around him, to the Chinese people that he's interacting with. And he becomes this real person, this virtuous person because of his want to survive. And this is a real interesting and beautiful subversion of the wartime trope of honor. And it really exposes the propaganda that's present in a lot of war cinema. So much of this film runs counter to what you would expect as like a typical message that we receive in traditional war films. You know, the final massacre of the film occurs not out of fear of survival, which is something you might see in like a Vietnam War film where the high strung, stressed out, like super young teenagers that have just been thrown into war, um, they don't know what to do. They, you know, they, 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 they kill a whole village because they think, oh no, there must be enemies there, but they're not. You know, this is a, a subtle portrayal of people committing horrible acts. And, and the implication is that they're doing it because it's like, you know, what they need to survive. And so they're the bad guys because they're so concerned with survival that, that, they, that, they, that they do this bad things, right? Again, it's like honor is more important than survival or keeping your virtue should supersede your survival, right? But in this film, the reality 
of the war crime is that it's not about survival. It's about nationalism. It's about allegiance to the country. It's about doing what the state tells you to do. And this is the cause of the war and the war crimes. This misguided state of duty, not the need for survival, that causes the violence and the, uh, and the horrible things to happen. So thematically, I think this film is a really unique entry into the war film canon. And in some ways, it's very similar to the great war film, anti-war film, Come and See. Um, the only problem, and I think the thing that causes this film to not be as good as it could be, is that it does suffer a little technically. Establishing the setting and the ambiance is a little bit neglected by Zhang Wen, I think. We don't get many wide shots or shots establishing place and setting. And this is a real shame because the setting and the ambiance are so interesting in this film. When we do get it, it's very welcome and it's very interesting and cool. I think we only get like one shot that establishes that this town that they're in is supposed to be near the Great Wall where the POWs are hidden. And it's in like the middle of the film after they've already been hidden in the wall. And so as an audience, audience member, I was kind of like, wait, what? What's going on? Like they're in the Great Wall. So that town is next to the Great Wall. Furthermore, so much of this film is shot in close ups. Uh, so many of the scenes are close up of a character, close up of a character, and they talk like this and it cuts. Close up, close up, close up, close up. There's no wides or even like two shots with multiple characters in them. And it's really distracting because we don't get this sense of space. So as an audience member following the scene and it cuts from close up, close up, close up in a conversation, our eyes feel kind of like we're darting all over the place. And we need this occasional wide to help a ground us in the scene and establish the layout of the space that we're in. And then you can move to your close-ups. And as an audience member, we can remember the kind of geography of the room we're in, and we can move around in close-up and feel more comfortable. If they did it that way, then I think it would have helped. Because I think what he was trying to do was give this frantic feeling, because he has these scenes with six or seven or eight people, and he's cutting close-up, 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 and the dialogue is very snappy, so he's cutting quickly, like, this guy's talking, this guy's talking, this guy's talking, this guy's talking, all these people are talking, and it makes it very frantic. And as an audience member, I think that would work if we've established the setting first and we know where we are and then we can feel like, okay, we're in this room with these people and our eyes are kind of bouncing left, right, left, right, 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 left, left, left. But now it's kind of like up, down, left, right, where am I? I don't know, is that guy there? Is this guy here? Is he moving over? Like you don't know where you are. And it also isn't helped by the fact that the camera is very shaky. Despite these technical shortcomings, I think the themes and the acting in particular, which is very good in this film, are able to carry this film and make it a great film and I, one that I would highly recommend. I think the acting and the way that the actors are able to maintain this comedic, farcical tone that transitions to tragedy and back to farce and to tragedy is very special. If you have any films that you'd like me to review, or if you like this film, or if you don't like this film, let me know in the comments and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.